The Christian community is under intense pressure. The surrounding culture embraces values that are at odds with the values of the Christian faith. And the culture entices believers to turn away from Jesus and to engage in immoral behavior. And at the same time, there are other religious groups who who claim that Jesus Christ is not the only way to God. There are religious groups who who may affirm Jesus as as a good teacher, but he's really not that important. And over time, some of those views start to seep into the church and they erode the faith of Christians. That is a very real situation happening in our nation today. It's happening around the world. And something very similar was taking place in the first century in the Greek city of Colossae. The church in that community was full of enthusiastic followers of Jesus, but they were new in their faith, and their faith was fragile. And the Apostle Paul became aware of the danger that this group of believers faced. And he does not want anyone or anything to draw them away from Jesus. And he wants to put a finger in the dike And protect these believers. So what should he say to those Christians? What words can he write that will catch their attention and give them hope during a time when their faith is under assault? As we saw last week, Paul began simply by affirming these men and women. He was thankful that they had made the life-changing decision to become followers of Jesus. And he told them, I can see tangible evidence of Jesus at work in your lives. And after laying that foundation of affirmation, Paul now wants to put Jesus into proper perspective for these believers. In fact, he wants them to see Jesus in such a way that all outside influences, all false teachings, and all the claims of all other religions will pale in comparison to the grandeur of Jesus. And to do that, Paul decides to write about the role of Jesus in creation. As the Colossians read this letter, Paul wants them to react this way. We know that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, but are you saying, Paul, that Jesus also is our Creator? Yes. That's exactly what Paul is saying. Let's take a look and see how Paul lays out this argument to strengthen the church in Colossae. Colossae chapter 1, starting in verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, And in him, all things hold together. There is no other religion that makes a claim that is anything remotely like this one. Jesus is the Son of God, but he is not just from God, he is God. And Paul explains that amazing fact to the Colossian Christians in two distinct ways. First, he says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And this means that Jesus exactly represents God the Father. Now, in making that statement, Paul's not saying something new. He's simply reiterating something that Jesus himself said. Jesus once said to his followers, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Because Jesus exactly represents God the Father. And I am so encouraged by the fact that the God who created us 
wanted us to know him. He did not want to remain a stranger to us. And so he chose to reveal himself and make himself known through Jesus. Jesus reveals who God is and what God is like because Jesus is a living portrait of God. And second, Paul tells the Colossians that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Now, that's not a reference to the physical birth of Jesus. It's a way of telling us that Jesus actually existed before creation. Jesus came first, before anyone else. That's why Paul says in verse 17, he is before all things. Jesus existed beyond time and space. And so he was with God and he was part of God before he ever took on the physical form that we know as Jesus. And once again, Paul is not saying something new. He's just reiterating what Jesus taught. Jesus once said to his followers that he existed in eternity long before God chose to reveal himself to Abraham. So Paul is using this phrase, this very distinct phrase, the firstborn of all creation, as a way to show the preeminence of Jesus. You see, in the ancient Middle East, the firstborn son had the most prestige. He was given the most honor. And so Paul, in a way that his culture can understand, Paul is stating that Jesus has greater honor, greater stature, greater significance, greater prestige than anyone or anything in all creation. It is a bold and powerful statement about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on to tell us why it is that Jesus occupies such an exalted role. We learn here from verses 16 and 17 that Jesus Christ was the catalyst for creation. He created everything that we can see. The sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the tides. Jesus created everything that we can't see. The wind, the gravitational force, the laws of thermodynamics. And he created kings and kingdoms and the laws by which we can govern ourselves. Whatever it is, Jesus made it all. And Paul offers this powerful description For two reasons. One is he wants to encourage the Colossians. He wants to strengthen their faith by enlarging their understanding of Jesus. But his words also are designed to strike right at the heart of all the erroneous teachings about Jesus that were then circulating within the Colossian community. Those false teachings came in many forms and under many names. But the main goal of all of them was to marginalize the role of Jesus Christ. And and Paul's response here, it, it is so crafty. It is very, very clever. He actually draws on Greek philosophy to show that Jesus cannot be marginalized because he is at the center of everything. In, in other words, Paul uses Greek logic to undermine the Greeks. He uses Greek logic to show that many Greeks were making false claims about Jesus. He turns the tables on them by using their own thought processes against them. Let me explain. Greek philosophers taught that everything which exists is the result of three distinct causes. First, there's a primary cause, which is the plan to produce something. Second, there's an instrumental cause, which is the power to produce it. And third, there's a final cause, which is the purpose for producing it. And in these three very short verses here in our text, Paul proclaims that when it comes to the creation of the heavens and the earth, Jesus covers all the bases. Jesus is the primary cause of creation because he planned it. 
Jesus is the instrumental cause of creation because he produced it through his power. And he is the final cause of creation because he had a purpose in making everything that he made. Everything was made in him and through him and by him and for him. And he is the one who literally holds creation together. He sustains our very existence. Without Jesus, we simply would not be here. He's at the center of everything. And when we truly grasp what Paul is saying, we should be filled with a sense of awe and wonder at who Jesus truly is. And we should open our eyes and realize that the fingerprints of Jesus are all over his creation. Evidence of his handiwork is everywhere in our world. And if someone says, I'd sure like to see Jesus, you know what a great answer is? Look around. Look around. How can you see one of our phenomenal Willamette Valley sunsets? And not be overwhelmed with a sense of awe at the beauty of what we witness. It's the handiwork of Jesus, our creator. He's the master artist and he's painting on the palette of his creation. Because he was and is the catalyst for our creation. And this is not simply an abstract concept. It It actually makes a huge difference in daily life. It impacts us at a very personal level. And we see that when we get to the end of verse 16 where Paul says all things have been created through him and for him. We've been created for Jesus. It pleased God to create us and we were created for his pleasure. And the implications of what Paul is saying here are huge. He's telling us that we are not a cosmic accident. We were created on purpose and for a purpose. And that is why each person is given a unique personality. Each person is given a unique mix of talents and abilities. Each person is given a unique blend of passions and interests. And God has poured all of that into each of us for his pleasure and for ours. And therefore, the most fulfilling way to enjoy life is to discover who God has created us to be and then to live that out to the best of our ability. Now, there's another very interesting aspect to what Paul is saying here. You see, if everyone has been created for Jesus, there's no exceptions. And that includes then people who don't even believe in Jesus. And sadly, people who don't acknowledge Jesus and accept Jesus are not able to live up to their full God-given potential. They can't fulfill the ultimate purpose for which they were created by God. But you and I have the privilege of changing that. Because we have the privilege of representing Jesus in this world. And we can have the opportunity to meet people who are far from God and get them connected to Jesus so they can experience what it means to be loved by God and forgiven by God just as we are. And people who don't know Jesus can be made new by Jesus. And that's the point that Paul wants to address next. He wants his readers to understand that the Jesus who created us is also the one who makes us into a new creation through his death and his resurrection. Let's continue on in this passage. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning And the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Jesus was not just the catalyst for the original creation. He's the catalyst for new creation. And new creation takes place whenever a person gets connected to Jesus. When someone comes to that moment where they acknowledge Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And they admit that they're separated from God by sin. And they want to repent. And and they choose then as a sign of faith to be immersed into Christ. In that moment, God makes us new. And he also draws us into a new spiritual community called the church. The church is the community of new creation. It's a community that is created as a direct result of the life and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. And this community called the church holds the message of new creation and the privilege of sharing it with the world. It's a community that consists of loved and forgiven people who humbly follow Jesus and acknowledge him as Lord, as Savior, as Creator. And Paul tells us here that Jesus, not any human being, is the ultimate head of the church. And it's a great reminder that every church functions best when we all acknowledge humbly that Jesus truly must be our leader. We must submit to him for the church to be healthy. And as Paul talks about new creation, he emphasizes once again, he can't make this point strongly enough, that the Jesus who is the head of our church, the Jesus who produces new creation within human beings, is God. He's not some sort of second God. He's not some lesser God. He is God because, as it says here, the fullness of God, the Father, dwells in him. And this amazing God chose to leave behind the glory of heaven, to come to earth, to take on physical form as a man, and to sacrifice himself on a cross for your sake and for mine. And then he rose from the grave, becoming, as Paul says, the firstborn among the dead. Now that's kind of an interesting phrase. We don't usually think of birth as associated with death. It's a statement, once again, of preeminence. Jesus is not the only person ever to be raised from the dead. He wasn't the first person to be raised from the dead. But he is the most prominent, the most significant, the most important person ever to be raised from the dead. It's because of his resurrection that we have the assurance of God's power over sin and death and we have the assurance of our resurrection and the life to come. And I find it amazing that our God was pleased to do all this. He loves mankind so much that he willingly, graciously endured the pain and the shame of the cross so that we could be reconciled to him. And we needed to be reconciled because we were alienated from God by our sinful behavior. One of the great tragedies of history is that mankind rebelled and turned away from God and we became enemies of our own creator. And God chose to not respond to that rebellion with hate. He responded with love. Someone had to pay the price for our foolish behavior. And our creator said, I'll do it. I will pay the price for you. And so the creator of heaven and earth became the catalyst for new creation. Providing an opportunity for every human being to be made new through Jesus. 
Because if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. And here is something that just humbles me. When we are reconciled to God, when we choose to be made new through Jesus Christ, God sees us not just as we are, but as we will become. Paul says he sees us as holy and without guilt. Now, God knows we're not perfect. But he sees us as we are in the process of becoming. And he sees what we will be in the next life. And this is not something we earn. It's just a gift that God gives. He sees us as holy. And so once again, do you want to see Jesus? If so, look around. His handiwork is evident in the lives of men and women who used to be enemies of God, but who are now being made new through the transforming work of Jesus Christ. People who are being reconciled to him. They're being changed because they've encountered Jesus, who is this catalyst for new creation. And as people become new, God says, I see you as holy. And Paul wants his readers to know that God will continue to see every Christian as holy as long as we continue to live by faith. And that's a key point that he uses to wrap up this portion of his letter. Let's look at verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Paul's goal is for these believers in Colossae to not yield to the values of the surrounding culture. He doesn't want them to yield to false teaching. Instead, he wants them to hold firmly onto their faith. And and in what he's written here, he's given them some solid reasons for continuing to trust Jesus. And he lets them know that Jesus is the catalyst for their continued faith because of the hope of the gospel. Now that phrase, the hope held out in the gospel, is loaded with meaning for Paul. He's saying that that the message of Jesus Christ is good news, and it's good news because Jesus has assured us of the hope of heaven. The hope of the gospel is that Jesus someday will return, and he will gather his church, and we will be together with him for eternity. And when Paul describes this as a hope, it is not some wishy-washy, wimpy, wistful hope. It is a sure and certain hope hope. It's a hope because we don't know when it's going to happen. But it's certain because it's been promised by Jesus himself and we can take Jesus at his word. And as Paul has said throughout this passage, we can trust Jesus because his handiwork is all around us. Jesus takes care of it all. Paul has shared with these Colossians, when you look to the past and you look to the act of creation, you see the handiwork of Jesus. When you look at the present and and you look at your own new creation as, as holy children of God, you see the handiwork of Jesus. And when you look toward the future, And place your trust in this promise of Jesus at the privilege of living with God forever. That's the handiwork of Jesus. Jesus is in and through every aspect of our creation and our world and our lives. And that's why Paul can state with great confidence as he does here. That this message has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Now he's not saying that everyone's actually had a preacher, preach to them. But Paul is so confident that the handiwork of God is plainly evident 
that those who look will see it. And he believes that people who sincerely look for God will find evidence of him within the creation and that people who are sincerely searching for God will find their way to Jesus. Now, how do we wrap this up and put it into practice in our own lives? Well, like the Colossians, we live in a world that wants to marginalize Jesus. We live in a culture whose values oftentimes are in sharp contrast to the values that we see in Scripture. So Paul's teaching has great application for you and me. And I believe that, that what we need to do is to take Paul's advice here to the Colossians and say, it worked for them, it can work for us, and we need to open our eyes so that we can more clearly see that Jesus is at the center of everything. And when we recognize that he is responsible for our creation, when he's responsible for our new creation, he's responsible for our future hope, then we have every reason to trust him, no matter how hard or difficult or confusing life may be. We must never forget that Jesus is the catalyst for creation, for everything that we can see and everything that we can't see. Jesus is the catalyst for new creation, for who we are. And Jesus is the catalyst for faith, for all that we are becoming and for all that lies ahead. The exhortation of this passage is to hold firmly on to Jesus, our creator and our sustainer. That's something that we need to take to heart as we try to live by faith in the midst of a very mixed up, hurting, and broken world. And it might be that you're here this morning and you've never taken that step of faith to get connected to your Creator. And if so, I want to invite you to speak with me before you leave today and allow your Creator to begin His work of new creation in your mind and your heart in your life today. Hold on to Jesus. He made us and he will sustain us.